Right, here we are again. There is so much human anatomy to talk about. I mean, imagine if you did it for a job, spending every week talking about human anatomy over and over and over again, and then you made videos for YouTube, and this was your 144th video in your anatomy playlist, and you've been putting one up every week without fail. Wouldn't it drive you a little bit? So this week, let's talk about something small and something fun. Uh, let's talk about... Not that bit. Testes, testicles, uh, male gonads, the balls, whatever. I'm in my echoeyest lab to talk about the testes. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll, we'll talk about where they are, we'll talk about their function, we'll talk about the gross structure, so the shape and the things that we can see grossly. We'll talk about the blood supply and the lymphatic drainage because that's really important. We'll talk about the innovation because it's logical and kind of interesting. And then we'll look at the histology um, and we'll, it's, it's basically tubes and stuff. But with a kind of an idea of thinking about um, testicular cancer, there are many, many good reasons for understanding, for having a good understanding of the anatomical structure of the testes and the other structures here. But testicular cancer is a particularly good one. So if we go down deep into the cells, when you know what cells are involved in here, then you have a very clear understanding of uh, what cancers might form from and why they might be different. So these are the male gonads. They are paired. The female gonads, the female equivalents, would be the ovaries, wouldn't they? They lie outside the body uh, for thermoregulation reasons. They lie within the scrotum, which is essentially an outpouching of the layers of the anterior abdominal wall. And by um, controlling blood supply around here and how far away they are from the body wall, um, the, the body can regulate the temperature of the testes to optimise their main function. Main function? Optimise one of their functions, um, spermatogenesis, the production of spermatozoa, the production of sperm, which happens on a on a constant throughput, right? Um, the other main job uh, that the testes do is to produce androgens, in particular testosterone, the male sex hormone. That's what these guys do. They are ovoid in shape, so like a three-dimensional oval, but they're not a perfect oval because they have this structure, this ridgy thing sat alongside. And it is important to be aware of the shape of the, of the testis because with testicular cancer, one of the advantages of these being outside of the body is that you can palpate them. So it's helpful to be able to recognize the normal shape of the testis. So you can then notice any abnormal changes, any lumps or bumps starting to appear that shouldn't be there. And there are some lumps and bumps which are normal. Of course, you can compare both sides and see if they feel similar. Um, <laughs> the, te the, the textbooks actually describe this. They describe the left testis as typically hanging lower than the right testis. And that's what we see in this model, <laughs> for whatever reason. And the testis is hanging from the spermatic cord and it's the spermatic cord that links the testis to everything inside the body. So that's where the arterial supply comes from, that's where the venous drainage goes out through, that's how the nerves get to and from the testis, um, and that's how the spermatozoa get from the testis out through the ductus deferens or the vas deferens. Um, there is a video about that path where I talk about the testis, and there is a video about the spermatic cord, um, but uh, I didn't talk about the structures of the testis in much detail in those, so I'm, I'm adding in this one, right? Because the scrotum in which the testis or testes lie is an outpouch of the anterior abdominal wall, that means the blood supply, venous drainage, innervation of the scrotum is different to that of the testes, all right? That's a key idea to get to grips with. Now, hopefully, um, you may have come across this before, and the, the gonads actually start to form in the embryo in the posterior abdominal wall. Um, there's an indifferent stage of development where the embryo could become male or female, but if um, there's a Y chromosome present, then the SRY gene, the sex determining region of the Y chromosome, 
causes a bunch of fun embryological changes um, and the embryo will become a male rather than a female. The testes are going to descend within the embryo to the final position down here um, as, they, as they form. Um, that means that the testicular artery is a, is a branch of the aorta. <laughs> See look, here's the abdominal aorta and these two little lateral branches here are the gonadal vessels. They could become ovarian arteries or um, testicular arteries. What have we got here? I cannot see a uterus. Uh, oh, there's a prostate gland in there. So this is a male, a male model. And so these are the testicular arteries running down here. And this is then that spermatic cord running through the abdominal wall. So there's the testicular artery running through there, right? So testicular arteries are branches of the aorta from the, ab from the up in the abdomen, they run down there. The veins do the same thing. And look, the left testicular vein actually runs up to the left renal vein because the inferior vena cava is shifted across to the right, whereas the right testicular vein drains back into the inferior vena cava directly. That's important for a whole bunch of fun reasons, but if we're thinking about testicular cancer, the lymphatic drainage is, is similar. So if the testes have descended down here and they've trailed the blood supply behind them, they've also trailed their lymphatic vessels, which means that a testicular cancer if it's going to spread to some lymph nodes, it can pass through those lymphatic vessels up to lymph nodes up here. Uh, lumbar lymph nodes, pre-aortic lymph nodes, para-aortic lymph nodes and that sort of thing. So that's, that's bad. If the testicular cancer spreads, it can spread into the abdomen, which is then obviously a lot more difficult to get to. Blood supply, um, lymphatics. Innovation then, innovation takes the same route. And if I, if I start talking about nerves, you're thinking about that sensitive, painful thing. Eh? So the testes have an autonomic nervous supply and because that autonomic nervous supply is also running with the vessels down here, so the testicular artery has a testicular plexus of nerves running with it. Um, if it's starting from up here, then you have parasympathetic nerves running from the vagus, because the vagus gets into this region, so we have vagal parasympathetic nerves running down to the testis, and then we also have sympathetic nerves running down to the testis through the same route from about um, the T10, T11 spinal level, something like that, you know, up here. Um, but of course, um, what this means is that the visceral afferents, so the sensory fibers from the testis, are following that same route back up here. And those visceral afferents are also going to run back to the spinal cord at about the T10 to the T11 level. So damage to the testes causing pain is likely to be felt not just down here, but you know, it's... So the testis itself, I've got one that I've taken off a model. Um, and you can see that this one's been cut in half, but there's the ovoid shape of the testis, which is then disrupted by this. There's a mass at the top here and a ridge running. This is the epididymis. And the epididymis is typically, typically described as being on the posterior part of the, 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 um, the testis. But as you can see on these models, mm, posterior is relative. The, the testes can move around within the scrotum and, you know, but if you, you should feel an ovoid shape with that ridge, the ridge is normal. There should be a lump on the superior pole, the superior end of the testes. That should be a lump as well. Those are normal things. So the testes are going to pass spermatozoa into the epididymis, and the epididymis is then going to pass into the vas deferens. Now, the, um, the testis is first of all covered by the tunica vaginalis. Now the tunica vaginalis, so if I said the scrotum is, is an outpouching of the anterior abdominal wall, so as the testes pulled through the anterior abdominal wall to get to this position, they pulled all the layers with them. They also pulled um, a layer of peritoneum, that serous membrane that's lining the abdominal cavity. And what we've got then is we've kind of got a double layered peritoneum situation, like we have with the pleura, like we have the peritoneum elsewhere. So we have um, visceral layer 
and a parietal layer of tunica vaginalis. So the visceral layer of tunica va vaginalis is covering the testis uh, and then that's continuous with a parietal layer over the top and there's a little bit of fluid in between. So those two layers of the tunica vaginalis mean that, you know, those two surfaces can glide over each other very easily, means the testis can move around within the scrotum. What's the advantage of that, I wonder? This advantage is you can get, you know, torsion and twist and that sort of thing, but what's, what's the advantage of that? Or maybe, maybe yeah, maybe it's because as the scrotum, you know, contracts and pulls up and relaxes and what have you, the, the testis needs to be able to move around freely within that, doesn't it? Rather than go, oh, getting hitched up and stuff. Okay, so that's, um, that's, that's peritoneum, that's like a remnant of the peritoneum. Now, if we look at the testis itself, the testis, if we cut a section through it, the, the structural, tough, fibrous capsule, the outermost bit of the, the testis, the bit that's giving it its shape, this is the tunica albuginea. Um, so that's the firm, fibrous outer thing. And the tunica albuginea, it's got this, this thickened ridge um, on the side where the the epididymis is, it's got this mediastinum kind of in the midline. And the tunica albuginea, if we look at this testis that's been cut through, it sends wedges, it sends bits of itself into the testis. So what it's doing is the tunica albuginea is not just forming the shape of the testis, it's also dividing the testis up into lobules. It's separating it up by sticking out, you know, wedges of itself, projections, it's septa, divisions, septa, that's the best word, fences. Um, so then we have these lobules in here. So those are the main structural things like tunica vaginalis, tunica albuginea. And then as we get into here, now we're getting into the tubules. Um, if one of the roles of the testis is to make spermatozoa, then what we've got in here is tiny, tiny tubules, a couple of hundred microns across, um, maximizing surface area. So massive, 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 massive surface area of seminiferous tubules packed into this. But now we're down to the histology, we need to go and have a look under the microscope at the structure of the testis to see what I'm talking about. In the edge of the seminiferous, seminiferous tubules, we have the germ cells around the outside, um, supported by Sertoli cells. Um, and the germ cells will proliferate and produce more spermatozoa through um, spermatogenesis. So the seminiferous tubules are the site of sperm production um, there is a seminiferous epithelium supported by a tunica propria, it's just a layer holding it all together. Now the seminiferous epithelium is made up of spermatogenic cells, so these are from the, uh, the germ cells. So it's these spermatogenic cells that will divide and make copies of themselves, so there are always spermatogenic cells, so you never run out, but they'll also divide and pass down the spermatogenesis pathway and in the lumen in the center of the, sperma the, um, the seminiferous tubules we see uh, spermatozoa forming and collecting. So there's this constant produ production of spermatozoa into the seminiferous tubules. So if you imagine how much the length of the seminiferous tubules we've got here, that's how uh, the testes are able to produce high numbers of sperm required for fertility. The other cells in the seminiferous tubules are Sertoli cells, and these are supporting cells. These are controlling the environment within the seminiferous tubules so that they're perfect for the uh, for spermatogenesis to occur. Now, interstitial cells, so in the tissue of the testes around the seminiferous tubules, we have Leydig cells, and it's the Leydig cells that make testosterone. And that's it, that's your testes, Sertoli cells, um, they look after spermatogenesis, spermatogenic cells actually make sperm and Leydig cells make testosterone. Super simple, right? So then it's just the tubules. We've got these, the seminiferous tubules and the seminiferous tubules all drain um, eventually into straight tubules. So we're working towards the epididymis here 
uh, and the straight tubules then drain into a rete or rete, rete testis. The rete, that, it means net, so it's like a, it looks like a net. Anyway, the rete testis, um, and then the spermatozoa drain pass across the rete testis into the efferent ductules of the testis and they then pass into the epididymis and then they descend down the epididymis and slowly mature as they go and they get into the vas deferens or the ductus deferens and then they're ready for, for use. Alright, so now we know about the cells that are within the testis. Uh, we, can, we can consider cancers that fall from the testicles because of course a cancer or a tumour is uh, the uncontrolled proliferation of a particular cell. So there are two types of, um, well there's, okay we can, we, can, we can break these things down. So germ cell tumours can form from the, uh, the cells that are forming spermatozoa, those, those germ cells, uh, and they can form seminomas or non-seminomas. And then you have uh, stromal um, cell cancers. So the stromal cells would be the Leydig cells and the Sertoli cells. So Sertoli cells can form a, a tumour, uh, Leydig cells can form a tumour. These are rarer forms of testicular cancer. You can also get um, uh, lymphomas forming in the testes. I think most commonly from B lymphocytes. We've also got, you know, uh, yeah, we've got a lymphocyte. We've got immune stuff everywhere. So you can also get lymphomas forming in the, in the testes. But I think the most common forms of testicular cancer are from the germ cells, which kind of makes sense because they're the busiest cells in the testes. They're constantly dividing and making new cells. So if that breaks down, then they keep going when they shouldn't. You get a, a germ cell tumour. And a seminoma is a type of germ cell tumour um, that is... Well, it has a particular histological appearance. Whereas the non-seminomas, it's another germ cell tumour, um, but because a germ cell has the potential to differentiate and form different types of tissue in the embryo or support tissues for the embryo, there are um, different classifications of non-seminoma testicular cancers or non-seminoma germ cell tumours um, because they start to form slightly different tissues, all right? But that's what we're thinking about. Testicular cancer either comes from the germ cells, which is most common, or it comes from the Leydig cells or the Sertoli cells, or maybe um, lymphoma. And that, that's all we're dealing with. Um, testicular cancer has a very good survival rate if treated, partly because it can be detected early. That's the most important thing with most, you know, with, with cancers generally, is the ability to detect them earlier and then respond to that and treat. Um, obviously, the testis will need to be removed. Uh, and if it's removed early enough, then hopefully little other treatment will be needed. But of course, we talked about the lymphatic system. We talked about how cancers can spread retroperitoneally to those lymph nodes in the abdomen. And uh, if you remove one testis, of course, you've got two. It actually doesn't affect fertility. It doesn't affect uh, sexual function. Um, and the other thing is, of course, is um, we talked about the testes descending. And sometimes testes don't descend normally uh, in the fetus. And uh, young boys have undescended testes. And it's important that those testes do descend either naturally or, I think, um, there's an increased risk of developing testicular cancer. Maybe they get, maybe, yeah. Anyway, anyway, that's it. The anatomy of, of the testis. All right. See you guys next week.